Let's say we have a signal, any signal at all, digital, analog, AC, DC, whatever, relative to a reference voltage, of course, the circuit ground. And let's say that this is a well-behaved signal. So we can plug this signal into whatever we want, and it's not going to just short circuit and run away current into ground. And then we have whatever we're doing with this signal. Let's say we're driving a load with this signal, of course, also referenced to negative circuit ground. So it looks great so far, but we have a problem. This signal may very well be generated by something that can't supply either sourcing or sinking, meaning going out or going in. It can't handle a lot of current flow, such as a microcontroller, a little CMOS, logic gate, whatever. Let's say we need to amplify this signal. We, we need the signal to stay the same, but we need more power. So what's the first option that comes to mind? A single transistor making an open collector output. Let's have an NPN transistor. The signal will control the base. The load will be connected to positive, and instead of negative, the load will go through the collector and out to negative there. Well, that functions on a basic level, but we've introduced a few problems. The first is that there is a dead zone. Base to emitter is sort of like a diode. It requires a minimal voltage to turn on. So if your signal is low, if it's just a bit above zero, it's not going to output. This is not a problem if you just have a digital signal that's either low or high. It's not going to matter. But let's say we're trying to handle any signal. So that's a problem. We have a dead zone. Second, we can only drive the load in one direction. Current is going to go through positive through the load, through the collector, through the emitter, to negative. We cannot put current the other way. Let's say we're trying to drive a motor. We might want the current to go backwards. We could add other stuff to the circuit, but let's say we're trying to keep it as simple as possible. We want to just be able to use this output this way. So that's a problem. It only goes one direction. Another problem is we cannot feed this with a negative input voltage. Again, we're trying to handle any reasonable signal. So no good. We can't use a negative input voltage or a negative signal, really. Now, if all you're trying to do is drive something with a purely binary input signal, something very simple, this is all you need. But that's not good enough for us. And there's even one more problem. This is a floating output half the time. When the signal is enough to turn on the transistor, then current is flowing through and we have a nice clean signal. If the transistor is not transisting, if it's not conducting through, you don't have a connection to negative, to zero, to the reference. You have an open circuit, which means signal noise, such as electromagnetic radiation in the air, static electricity, whatever, noise from the rest of the circuit, can feed the load. That's bad. So let's try something a little more interesting. Let's hook the load back up the way it was, and let's add a piece. Let's use a logic gate. So we have our positive, a resistor, an NPN to negative, and you take your output as normal. You've seen an inverter before, and there you go. So we've solved the floating output problem. You're getting an affirmative connection to the positive here or to the negative here, no matter what the signal is. But we've inverted the signal and we've introduced variable output impedance. If your signal is low, I did it again. This goes to the base, doggone it. If your input is low, the transistor is off and you've got this as your output impedance. If your input is high, the transistor is on and you've got effectively no output impedance. That can be an issue. Well, we can solve the inversion fairly easily. We just add a second inverter. So now the input signal is not inverted, but we still have the problem that we can only drive the output one way. We still have the dead zone and we still have variable output impedance. And now we've quadrupled our component count. What if we take an idea from CMOS? Let's get rid of these resistors. And what if I swap an NPN for a PNP so I have one of each? We hook up our power through an NPN. We have a junction, our PNP out to negative. Our input signal is going to feed both of these bases and the output will be between them. And then, I can do something even more tricky and add a negative voltage. So we've got our circuit positive, our circuit ground, and our circuit negative. I suppose I should print out a ground symbol, but I'm stubborn. So what does this do? If the signal is higher than zero, and we've got the zero signal coming through the load to here, then we have forward biased the base emitter junction on the NPN, and the positive can flow out through the load to zero. Whereas this PNP, since the base is higher than the emitter at zero, it's off. So we are sourcing current out. If the signal is below zero, then the NPN base to emitter junction is not forward biased, but the emitter to base of the PNP is, and we're going from zero to a negative, and we are sinking current through the PNP. Welcome to a push-pull 
output stage. And the first thing you may look at is, I've hooked these up wrong, remember? We're always supposed to have the load going through the collector, not the emitter. Well, it's not that big of a deal. It is an issue, but right now we're just not going to worry about it because this is not the final circuit. And in the final circuit, that's not going to be a problem. Here, it is a little wiggly. Your base emitter current is going to be contaminating, so to speak, the load. Let's not worry about it. We have solved several problems, but now we still have the dead zone problem. If the signal is a little bit above or a little bit below zero, it's still not going to turn one of these on. So we're still losing signal near zero. But we can drive the load both ways. We can use a negative voltage, which is how we get the bi-directional drive through the load. Everything's hunky-dory except that dead zone. Just for fun, this is a class B amplifier. Remember the audio? You can make a similar amplifier like this for audio, and it'll work, but you'll get that clipping issue. It's really crappy, but it's incredibly power efficient. But we talked about a class A amplifier, and how did we make a class A amplifier work and have the best audio fidelity? We biased the signal so that the transistor was always in its operating range. Well, this splits the signal in half. Positive signals will turn on this. Negative signals will turn on this. And in the middle, we have that dead zone. When the signal is near zero, we still have a floating output. So that's still an issue, but we're gonna fix that anyway. We need to change this input to be properly biased. And we're gonna do it in a smart way. Instead of all that fuss and mess we used for the class A amplifier to set a specific value, we only need a rough one. We only need to get most of the signal back. So let's say we have positive and our negative. Let's have a couple resistors and let's have a couple diodes. Our input signal is going to feed in between the diodes and on either side of the diode will be our output signals. So if you remember your Kirchhoff loops, You've got positive through a resistor, a diode, a diode, a resistor, and a negative. That's a complete loop, so we can decide our voltages from that. The diodes are each going to have fixed forward voltage drops. And if the resistors are equal in value, then this is still going to be a midpoint. These are equal, these are equal, roughly, so it's going to be roughly in the middle. So we've got positive here, negative here, this is going to be roughly zero. But up here is going to be roughly plus a voltage drop. And down here is gonna be roughly minus a voltage drop. The voltage drop of a diode is about the voltage drop of a base emitter junction. So when the signal is zero, then this is at its nice midpoint, and this is about a diode up, and this is about a diode down. So both of these are just on a razor's edge of being on. They may be on a trickle, but they're on enough. And then if the signal goes up or down, it's going to change the voltage here. One of these resistors is going to have a bigger drop, and one of them is going to have a littler drop, a smaller drop, which is going to stop forward biasing one of these and more strongly forward bias the other. So now we've gone into something called a class AB amplifier. It takes more power, but it doesn't take as much power as a class A amplifier. You still have some power drain, but you have less power drain. It's still not perfect. The signal does have a small amount of distortion around the center point, but we've mostly solved the problem. But we have four more components and it's messy and it's still not great. But we have our negative voltage. We have actually gotten rid of the floating output this time. We can drive the load both ways. Everything's hunky-dory. We're done, but we can do better. Remember the flavor of the month, the op amp. The op amp uses something called feedback. It's basically a magical little device that has a little gremlin inside that manually turns the knobs up and down to get the result you want. And we are going to employ this gremlin to great effect. Let's have an op amp and slap it down. As a reminder, I've made videos on op amps, so I don't have to explain the whole thing. Essentially, the intuitive way to look at an op amp is you have a non-inverting input, a positive input, and an inverting input, a negative input. The differential input is the positive minus the negative. So five volts here and five volts here is a differential of zero. Five volts here and four volts here is a differential of one. Four and five is minus one. The op amp is a feedback device. You connect the output to the input in various different ways, and the op amp will do whatever it takes to make sure the differential input is zero. The feedback and the internal circuitry of this op amp will wiggle its output. There's that little gremlin. He's gonna turn those knobs until his inputs are zero. Whatever the output ends up being, the inputs are gonna be zero between them. One minus the other will be zero, so the inputs will be the same. That's the magic. So what if we take the input and we shove it right into that positive non-inverting input. And of course we need to connect it to power, which is not usually drawn, but I'll draw it in this case just to remind us 
that the op amp is receiving the positive and negative voltage. Well, what's the negative input? What's the inverting input? Well, we need our transistors back, don't we? And we're going to do it just like before. We're going to hook them up to positive and negative, and the output is going to be between them. So we're kind of backsliding a little bit here, just like so, to the output. The op amp's output is going to drive both transistors, and the only thing left is the feedback. The feedback is the output. What the load gets also goes into the inverting input. There's no resistors, remember? In those videos about op amps, where I had resistors in different configurations, that was to control the gain. If you don't use resistors, it's what's called unity gain. In this case, in this configuration, you're going to get unity gain. It's going to be input and output is the same. Let me show you. The input signal is going into the positive, the non-inverting input. The output signal is going to go into the inverting input, positive and negative. So our signal minus our output. We we want the signal and the output to be the same. We're trying to amplify the power. We don't want to change the voltage. We're trying to amplify the power. So signal minus output, if they're the same voltage, should be zero volts. That's what the op amp wants. That's what that gremlin wants. So whatever this output ends up being, whatever the voltage, current, whatever, going into these transistors, it's going to be adjusted so that this spot is equal to the input. Signal minus output equals zero. Therefore, signal equals output. Now, I would show you this on a breadboard. I made the circuit and tested it. It works just fine. But there's nothing to show. Unfortunately, the, the whole point of this is to change nothing but allow you to drive a bigger load. The input voltage is the output voltage. It just works. And I tested it with positive and negative voltages. Works just fine. So let me walk through this a couple times to make it clear to you. If the signal is greater than zero, we have a positive on the non-inverting input. So that means we need the same value here. So this, in order to get a positive voltage here, we're going to have to turn on the NPN and turn off the PNP. So the output voltage is going to go up. We're going to have something that is above zero on the base of the PNP and zero through the load, see zero through the load, on the emitter. So not forward biased. Remember, it has to be forward biased in the direction of the arrow. We've got higher on base than emitter, so it's closed. But this one, we've got higher on base than emitter, because base is a positive value. Emitter is zero. So the NPN will turn on, and you'll get a positive voltage out here. And then it'll feed back, and the positive voltage will go up and down until the beta amplification whatever of this transistor is giving you the right current. But we're talking about voltage, remember. Load. Load is an effective resistance. Whether it's a resistor or not, it's an effective resistance. Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance, whatever the effective resistance from moment to moment is. So a certain amount of current going to the load is going to give you a certain voltage drop. Or you could look at it as there's a voltage drop. Whatever's causing it, ohmic or not, the load is going to have a certain voltage drop. And so you've got a Kirchhoff loop positive through the collector, emitter, and out the load there. So the voltage drop of the load varies by the current through this varying and so forth. But the point is, it's turning on the NPN and not turning on the PNP. The amplifier here is sourcing current. It's going out to the load into zero. If the signal is negative, it's below zero. So it wants the output to be below zero, minus two, minus, minus two equals zero. So in order to get a negative voltage, we have to open up this PNP. So this voltage is going to go down. We're going to have zero and something below zero, forward biasing, emitted a base. PNP will turn on. And current will be going from the circuit ground, through the load, through emitter, collector, and out, the circuit negative. And then we're going to have zero on emitter, something below zero on the base, so this NPN is going to be off. And we don't have a dead zone because this feedback is going to tweak them at zero or at very close to zero. It's going to be super fiddly, and there's going to be the tiniest currents running through this thing. But you get yourself a nice quality op amp, it's going to have good accuracy, and you'll still have that nice, exact, 
or near exact signal at zero because whichever you know small differences in manufacture maybe this one will turn on maybe this one will turn on but you'll get that very close to zero voltage and then of course the stronger the signal is as long as it doesn't clip but the stronger the signal is within the normal operating range of your positive and negative supply voltages the easier it's going to be the less you're going to be affected by just random noise so that's the magic the magic of an op amp solves the problem of floating outputs it allows us to have bi-directional supply, bi-directional current flow through the load. We can have positive and negative signals. We can have everything we want and no resistors. We assume the signal is well behaved, that the signal is not going to produce, like we could hook the signal directly to circuit ground and it would not be a short circuit. So we're assuming that. We're also assuming that the load is well behaved, that we could hook the load directly to positive or negative power and it wouldn't be a short circuit, that there's resistors in there or whatever. So if those two things are true, then there is no current path through this thing that is going to be a short circuit and we don't need resistors. The only possible path that'll short is through positive collector emitter, emitter collector, and negative. Only one of these is going to be on at the same time, just like a CMOS configuration. One of the CMOS, one of the MOSFETs in the CMOS is on at the time and the other one is not. Near zero or when it's switching, there can be momentary flow through that is technically a short circuit, but it's going to be brief. It's really probably not going to be a problem. If you need to, you can add resistors, add yourself some small resistors, put an equal value resistor on the top and bottom. So on the collector here and the collector here, you could add resistors and you can do this with CMOS too, if you really need to. If it becomes a problem or you're just super worried, just add a resistor here and a resistor here of equal value to preserve your midpoint at zero. And it's going to slightly reduce the response rate of your circuit because resistors always make everything slower. If it's a small resistor, it's going to be negligible. We're not working at gigahertz, terahertz frequencies here. It's obviously going to make your circuit bigger and increase part cost, and it's going to cut your room. So you've got positive and negative supply voltage to work with. It's going to reduce your window, just like for the class A amplifier, you have a window to work with. So it's going to reduce your window slightly because those resistors will have a voltage drop and the op amp is wiggling the output voltage up and down within that window. But you're probably going to have supply voltage much greater than your signal anyway. For example, I hooked my op amp up to positive and negative 5 volts, but my op amp is only able to output plus 3 some volts and like minus 4.5 volts when I hook it up to plus and minus 5. Now, you can get a nice high quality op amp with CMOS that's going to go all the way to the top and bottom, but mine doesn't. So my op amp can't even output signal anyway, so it's not a problem. But you can do that, but you shouldn't need to. So with one op amp, one PNP and one NPN transistor and nothing else, well, and a negative power supply. So you need a dual power supply or you need to take one power supply and split it somehow. You can do that. But however you do it, that's all you need. Those three pieces. And you have an output stage that you can stick on anything. And some integrated circuits actually include this output stage in them. For example, I'm about to get into the 555 timer and its output is a push-pull, which means it can drive more current, more power than the internal circuitry of the timer can anyway. But keep this in mind, you still want to use this, you still want to keep this in mind and make it yourself out of discrete components if you're driving something like a motor. Because when you have an integrated circuit, even if it's something like this, it's still going to be somewhat limited. We're still going to be talking about maybe hundreds of milliamps, which is quite a bit for digital circuitry, for signal circuitry. But if you're trying to drive a motor, if you're trying to drive some big load, or if you have a big fan out, let's say this output, you're trying to drive 10 things and each thing doesn't take much power but you're driving 10 of them at once so then you need a total output power to handle the fan out so you're going to need more power in that case than the chip can probably supply so you're going to still want to be able to make this circuit out of discrete components for the highest power things you ever do but once again we are impressed 
by just how much magic is done by the op amp. Now, you won't be that surprised if you ever look at the actual circuit diagram of an op amp. I'm going to make one someday, but that'll be far in the future because there's a lot of parts in there. Making your own homemade discrete op amp is not a simple one night task. So it is a complex beastie, but it's a common one and you can get a whole bunch of them for cheap. So now you know how to supply a signal with more power. And while you do that, I'll be seeing you.